Hello guys and welcome to another live session for the P fours. So last time out, we concluded all of the papers uh, related to the most recent exam year, which was 2022. And now as discussed, we are now going back to 2021. So let's start with those papers. And again, uh, some of you who have been with me since the topical sessions and have also gone through the recording. So they might uh, see that some of the questions are familiar, but again, there might be some that we didn't do. So please be sure to pay attention to this and whatever you don't get, you can just drop those in the chat box or in the Q&A tab uh, and, I'll get a, and I'll look at them whenever I get a chance to. So let's start. So the first question, so this one, so this is the first question. Just a second, the audio seems to be So this is the, just a second guys, something is up with the audio. Hello, hello, hi, hello. Now this is better. So this is question number one. So the first part of this question says state Newton's law of gravitation. Again, we've been looking at this question quite a few times, even uh, just in this uh, yearly past paper session. So we know that what Newton's law of gravitation says is all you can see in this formula. Right? So basically you have to say two things here. This is a constant. So the gravitational force of attraction, this is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance, uh, to the square of the separation between the masses. So I'm just writing this in uh, a slightly short form here. So the gravitational force of attraction, is directly proportional or just proportional will do just as well. So this is proportional to product of masses and inversely proportional
to the square of the separation. Next part. So part B says planets have been observed orbiting a star in another solar system. Measurements are made of the orbital radius r and the time period t of each of these planets. The variation with r cube of t square is shown in figure 1.1. So this is the graph that you are expected to work with. And let me just zoom out a bit so we can see both these axes at once. So on the y-axis you have time squared which is in the units of year squared and this is r cube which is in 10 to the 34 meter cube so since radius is supposed to be in meters in the si unit so this is r cube uh, so this unit is uh, all right with us but there is a multiple of 10 to the 34 here right and here this uh, time is not in si units either and this is also year squared so in a2 physics and i've emphasized this a lot in all of the questions we've done that you need to take a lot of care in the graphs that you're working with. What are the units? What are the multiples that go along with the graph? So now let's zoom back in again. The relationship between T and R is given by T square equals four pi square R cube upon GM. And this is not the first time we've seen a relationship like this. We know how we also can derive this thing. So the way that you derive this is you set the gravitational force equal to the centripetal force, right? So this is how you can uh, reach this equation, right? So here this uh, gravitational force, what we actually talked about above in the first part, and if you just equate that to <clears throat> any variant of the centripetal force, you can come up with this equation. And we've done that, I think, two times in the papers we've did uh, recently. So this relationship is already given. You don't have to work this out. Where G is the gravitational constant and M is the mass of the star, right? So this is the star around which all these planets were in orbit. And now we need to determine the mass M. So here, if you think about it, T square here uh, was the variable on our Y axis. R cube was the variable on our X axis. So then what this means is everything else which is left here. So all of this is basically the gradient of my line, right? So the gradient is just four pi square upon GM, right? Because this was the quantity on your Y axis. R cube was the quantity on the X axis. And then what else remains basically becomes the Y interest, uh, becomes the gradient. So if we go back up, so t square is proportional to r cube is also another way I can uh, say this. So basically my graph is a straight line passing through the origin, which basically allows me to say that these quantities are directly proportional. So all I need to do to calculate the gradient is, so the cool thing about uh, a graph like this, which is passing through the origin, is that one point is always going to be zero comma zero. Right, And now to calculate the gradient, I just need one other point. So this point seems neat. We can just work with this. So this point is going to be 0.8 into 10 to the 34. And this time, so the problem is this time uh, corresponding to this coordinate. Let me just mark this here. So this time is 1.6 year squared. Right, so this is 1.6. So for now, let me just keep it as it is. And later I'm going to be converting this years to seconds as well. So 0.8 into 10 to the 34 and 1.6. So first, if I calculate the gradient, so I have my two points, one is zero comma zero, and the other point is So 0 0.8 into 10 to the 34 and 1.6. So first of all, let me just try to convert this 1.6 year squared into, uh, what do you call it? 
So let, let's try to convert this into seconds, right? <clears throat> so if I think about it, one year has 365 days, right? Each of those days has 24 hours. Each of those hours has 60 minutes and each of those minutes has 60 seconds, right? So just multiplying this, and I also talked about the fact that this number, which is basically the number of uh, seconds in a, a day. So this is also, it's just uh, good if you know this by heart. So this value is 86,400. So to calculate the number of seconds in one year, I just multiply these values together. So this turns out to be 31.536. into 10 to the six, right? So this is one year. So if I need to calculate the value of uh, one year squared, so if I just square both these sides, so one year squared would be this value squared as well. So this becomes 9.945 into 10 to the 14. So if I need to calculate the, so if I need to calculate 1.6 years squared into seconds, so I'm simply going to multiply by this value, right? This is just the unitary method. So if one year squared is this many seconds squared actually, so how many uh, seconds squared would 1.6 be, right? So 1.6 into this value, 9.945 into 10 to the 14, right? So if I calculate the gradient from here, so this would be y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. So basically this value divided by this value. So this gradient, So you just need to substitute this in your calculator. So this is going to be 9.945 into 10 to the 14 into 1.6 divided by 0 0.8 into 10 to the 34. So this turns out to be 1.989 into 10 to the negative 19. Right? So from here, and let me just get a bit more space to work with. So this was the conversion part. This was the calculation of the gradient. So from here, if I just make uh, M the subject of this formula, so this is going to be four pi square upon G times the gradient, right? So G times the gradient. So, no need to show any more working, any more steps. Now we can just uh, work with this formula. So four pi square, G is 6.67 into 10 to the negative 11 times whatever value we got. So this mass turns out to be 2.97 into 10 to the 30. So just to two as if this would become 3.0 into 10 to the 30 kilograms, right? So this is how you uh, had to do this part. So this is done, let's go on to the next part. A rock of mass M is also in orbit around the star and B. The radius of the orbit is R. Explain why the gravitational potential energy of the rock is negative. So this question, again, uh, we've also done in the topical past paper sessions, which is why the gravitational potential energy is negative. So there are two ways you can explain this, but either of those ways start off with the identification of the fact that we define the potential at infinity to be zero, right? So the first thing you have to write is that the potential at infinity is 
defined to be zero. Right, and from now, from here, you have two paths. Either of those you can walk. So the first thing is to say, so and basically the difference in both of these paths is let's say this is the mass and this is some point far away. So this is infinity, right? So if you are bringing a mass from infinity to a point in the field, so if you think about it, if you are bringing this mass to a point inside the field, so another thing we know about gravitational fields is, the, is that the gravitational force is always attractive, right? So when we are bringing this mass inside, what's going to happen is that I am going to be moving along the field lines, right? So what's going to happen is this is going to lose its energy. So if it's already zero and if it's going to decrease further, this value will turn out to be negative. This is one way you can talk about it. Or another point is, for example, if you have the, so if you have the uh, point mass already in the field, if you need to push it all the way out to infinity, so again, the gravitational forces are attractive, right? So you would have to give it some energy so that here the potential becomes zero at infinity, right? So here you would need to do work so that this increases to zero. So only obviously negative values, if they keep increasing, 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 only then can they become zero. So either of these paths you can take in writing the answer to this. So the potential at infinity is defined to be zero. Next, gravitational forces are always attractive. To push this mass, so to push this rock out to infinity, requires work to be done. against gravitational forces. Right, so that's why the gravitational potential energy is negative. So I, adopt, I adopted the path where we talk about a mass being pushed out to infinity, but again, you could also write a part where you say that the mass is being brought into the field from infinity. show that the kinetic energy EK of the rock is given by EK equals GMM upon 2R. So for the kinetic energy, we know what's going to happen is that there is this gravitational uh, force of attraction, right? So since it is an orbit around the star and B, so the gravitational force of attraction will actually be providing the centripetal force. Right, so the M's cancel and the R's cancel partially as well. So basically what we get from this equation is that V square equals So what we get is that V square equals GM upon R, right? So if we now write the formula in terms of uh, the kinetic energy, which is half mv square. So half times mass times gm upon r. So this becomes what we have above here. So this becomes gmm upon 2r, right? The next part, and this is the last part of this question, use the expression. So use the expression in C part two to derive an expression for the total energy of the rock. So here, uh, if you talk about the total energy, so that would be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, right? 
So the kinetic energy, uh, the expression for that we calculated above. And for the uh, potential energy, we know that the potential energy, so let me write this here. So the potential energy would be M times delta phi, right? So if I think about it, that is the mass of this rock times the gravitational potential. So the change in the gravitational potential, again, if it's being brought in from infinity, uh, so the change in the gravitational potential would just be the gravitational potential itself, right? So that would simply be the gravitational potential inside the field, which would be this and the potential at infinity that would be, uh, sorry. So that would be zero, right? So this becomes minus G M M upon R. So if I just add both of these together, so this plus minus G M M upon R, So if I just do the algebra for this, so obviously the denominators are not same at the moment, I would need to take the LCM. So multiplying the denominator by two and the numerator uh, by two as well. So this would become minus two GMM plus GMM. So overall this would become a minus GMM upon two R. Right? So that's how you have to do this part. Let's go on to question two. So let's have a look at this question. Just a second. Hello. So let's have a look at question number two. So question number two says, a fixed mass of an ideal gas is at a temperature of 21 degrees centigrade. The pressure of the gas is 2.3 into 10 to the five pascals and its volume is 3.5 into 10 to the negative three meter cube. Calculate the number of uh, the number N of molecules in the gas. So for the number of molecules in the gas, and again, the uh, catch here is this, that this is an ideal gas. So if you think about the number of uh, molecules in the gas, obviously we would have to make use of either of the two uh, variants of the ideal gas equation we have. So here, if I think about this, so among PV equals NRT and the other one, which is PV equals capital NKT. 
t. So obviously this one would be better suited because I need to find the number of molecules and not the number of moles in the gas. So if we use PV equals NKT and if we need to find capital N, so this would become PV upon KT. So the pressure is 2.3 into 10 to the 5 pascals. The volume is 3.5 into 10 to the negative 3. K is the Boltzmann constant, right? And even before K, if we talk about T, so T here is in degree centigrade. And whenever using the ideal gas equation, we always talk about thermodynamic temperature. And that simply means that your temperatures need to be in Kelvin. So this would be 21 plus 273. And the Boltzmann constant uh, K is 1.38 into 10 to the negative 23. So we just need to plug all these numbers into our calculator and press enter. So 2.3 into 3.5 into 10 to the 5 minus 3. 1.38 to the so 1.38 into 10 to the negative 23 times 294. So this is 1.98 into 10 to the 23. Our least number of significant figures is two. So you can give your answers either to two or three SF. So to two SF, this would be 2.0 into 10 to the 23. The mass of one molecule of the gas is 40 U. Determine the root mean square speed of the gas molecules. So for this, we know that we would have to use an equation, which again has the root mean square speed apparent. So such an equation we know is this, PV equals one by three NM C square, right? So if we need to calculate C square, so that would simply be three PV, upon n m right so again here it's worth remembering that uh, m is the mass of one molecule of gas and this is the total number of particles of uh, the total number of molecules in your gas so 3 pv upon n m so this becomes so pv was so the pressure was 2.3 into 10 to the 5 and the volume was 3.5 into 10 to the negative 3. So if we so 2.3 into 10 to the 5 and 3.5 into 10 to the negative 3. And N is the number of uh, molecules which you calculated above, 2 into 10 to the 23. And M is the uh, mass of one molecule of gas. So 40 U, so 40, and U is 1.66 into 10 to the negative 27. So from here, you can get the, uh, so first, this would be the mean square speed. So this value, if we calculate this, so 2.3 into 10 to the 5 is 3 to 3.5, 2 into 10 to the 23, to 40 into 1.66 into 10 to the negative 27. So I forgot to multiply by 3. So this is 18200. Zero, zero. Right, so this is the mean squared speed. So to, uh, so to just get uh, the root mean square speed, so you would have to take the square root as well. So the square root of this, this turns out to be 426. So just to uh, 2 SF, this would be 430 meters per second. On to the next part.
the temperature of the gas increased by 84 degrees centigrade. Calculate the value of this ratio, the new RMS speed of the molecules divided by the original RMS speed of the molecules. So what we can do is now we can calculate the uh, new temperature, uh, the new RMS speed corresponding to this temperature, right? So if you think about what we did in the previous parts, so we were given this temperature and we calculated the number of molecules according to, so we calculated the number of molecules according to this temperature, right? But now this temperature is going to change, right? So according to this uh, new number of molecules, we can get the, sorry, so this is the number of molecules, right? So if the temperature is going to change, what is going to happen? So PV is going to change, right? So if temperature is going to change, so temperature is like the right-hand side of this equation. So PV is going to change as well, right? So then we can use uh, that part of the equation. So because N, the number of molecules would remain the same. K is a, K is a constant, that's going to be the same. T is going to change, so this right-hand side I can just set equal to whatever this is. So obviously PV would change, right? Because that's what the ideal gas equation says that PV upon T is a constant, right? So this is going to change and then we can just divide this by uh, capital N M, right? So PV instead of PV, we can write capital N K T. And something we could have done in the previous part earlier, but I wanted to show you uh, this in another part just to show that you can do this using either of the methods. So since uh, we can write C square, so the equation we were working with above was C square equals 3 P V upon capital N M. So here if uh, instead of P V, if we write the right hand side of the equation, so this would become 3 N K T upon N M, right? So these cancel out. So C square is then simply equal to three K T upon M. So three K is 1.38 into 10 to the negative 23. And this new temperature, so previously the temperature was 21. So 273 plus 21, plus 84. So this is the new RMS speed divided by the mass of one molecule, which is uh, still 40 U. So 40 into 1.66 into 10 to the negative 27. Right? So we can calculate this. So C squared, this turns out to be Three into one point three eight into ten to the negative negative twenty three into two seventy three plus twenty one plus eighty four upon forty into one point six six into ten to the negative twenty seven. So this turns out to be two thirty six thousand. Again, taking the square root, the RMS speed. turns out to be 485 meters per second, right? So the new uh, RMS speed is 485. The old RMS speed was 430. So this can give us the value of the ratio. So 485 divided by 430. This is 1.127 or just to 2SF 1.1. Right, and another way in which you, can, you could have done this question is, uh, so if you look at this equation, so C square equals three KT upon M. So here three is a constant, K is a constant, M is a constant as well. So C square is simply uh, proportional to T. So another way to do this question could have been that since C square is proportional to T, so if I want to find the ratios of the RMS speeds, right? So this, this would just be the new temperature divided by the original temperature 
and under the square root because there's a square here. So this is another way in which you could have done this exact same question. Now let's go on to question three. Three part A says using a simple kinetic model of matter, describe the structure of a solid. So how do we describe the structure of a solid? So again, always with the kinetic model of matter for any state of matter, you can talk about two things. So one of those is the arrangement of the particles and another is the movement. So I can say that particles are arranged regularly and close together. So this is the point about the structuring and then about the movement, I can say that particles are vibrating about their fixed positions. On to the next point, uh, the next part. The specific latent heat of vaporization is much greater than the specific latent heat of fusion for the same substance. Explain this in terms of the spacing of molecules. So basically what the examiner is asking in terms of symbols is why is LV, the latent heat of uh, vaporization, much greater than the latent heat of fusion, right? So fusion means turning a solid into a liquid and the latent heat of uh, vaporization means turning a liquid into a gas. So if we think about this in terms of the spacing of the molecules, so we know that in part in solids, particles are not very far apart. They're actually the closest in all of the states of matter and they're almost touching. In liquids, the particles are only slightly further apart, right? So they can move in clusters is one explanation, right? So from fusion, when we are converting solids into liquids, we don't have to actually supply a lot of energy because the change in the spacing is not very significant. But if we talk about the change in the spacing from a liquid to a gas, so in gases, we say that we actually have no forces of attraction or that the molecules are so far away from another that there is no forces of attraction. So here you have to do a lot more work. So in uh, vaporization, you have to do a lot more work in separating the distances of the molecules by much more than was required in fusion, right? So in fusion, from solid to liquid, you'd only have to increase the spacing by a little bit. You only have to supply that much energy. But in vaporization, because you have to increase the spacing by so much, you have to uh, supply a lot more energy. So much greater increase in spacing and vaporization and vaporization compared with fusion. Right? Part C, a heater supplies energy at a constant rate to 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.045 kilograms of a substance. The variation with time of the temperature of the substance is shown in figure 3.1. The substance is perfectly insulated from its surroundings. So this means that there is no heat lost uh, to the surroundings. So this is the complete graph. So you have on the x-axis time in minutes, on the y-axis you have temperature in degrees centigrade. So usually in heat experiments like these, you do have time in minutes, but we know for a fact that this is not our SI unit. 
determine the temperature at which the substance melts. So here, if I think about this, and if I look at this graph, so I have, uh, I know that melting is a change of state and that only occurs at a constant temperature, right? So constant temperature on this graph would mean a horizontal line and I have two of those. I have one here and then I have another one here. So when, uh, which one should I select? So if I think about it, so let's say if this was uh, actually the part where the solid was melting, right? So if the solid was melting here, so what would happen is it would have been a solid all the way up till this point as it was increasing in temperature. And then during the state change, it stays at the same state. It stays at the same temperature while the state change is occurring. And then after all of it has turned into liquid, then it, the temperature starts increasing again. But then this would mean that what does this even mean, right? Because obviously you have three states of matter. So if this is solid and this is liquid, so what comes before solids? So do solids freeze to become something else? And the answer is no, right? So this must uh, be a solid. This must be the melting portion. This must be the liquid. This must be the boiling portion. And this is when all of it has become gas, right? So this is the melting part. So the temperature here is minus 100 degrees centigrade. So the temperature is minus 100 degree centigrade. The power of the heater is 150 watts. Uh, use data from figure 3.1 to calculate in kilojoules the specific latent heat of vaporization of the substance, right? So vaporization talks about making something into a vapor, right? So changing the state from liquid to gas. So if we go back up, so obviously if this one is boiling, so this must be, uh, sorry, if this is melting, so this must be the boiling part of the gas, of, of the object that we have, right? So if I think about it, I know the power of the heater, right? And since there is no heat loss, so I can simply multiply my power with this time to get the energy supplied by the heater. So this energy supplied must be the energy which is also absorbed by the uh, substance, again, because there is no heat loss. So first, let's uh, talk about these times. So this time is, so if I just zoom into this, So this time right here is right in the middle of eight and nine. So this is 8.5. And this uh, change in state started at this time, which is three. So 8.5 minus three, the time during which the change in state is actually occurring. So this is going to give me the time for which the heater was actually supplying energy, which was uh, causing a change in state, right? So 8.5 minus three, this is going to be the time in minutes and I multiply that by the power, right? So the power of the heater. So the time, so if I calculate the energy, so that would be PT. So this would be uh, 150 times 8.5 minus three. So this time was in minutes. So to convert this to seconds, I multiply by 60 again. So 150 times 5.5 .5 times 60. This is 49,500 watts, uh, sorry, joules. And this must be the same energy which is absorbed by the substance. So if I use E equals ML here, right? So 49,500 is the energy. The mass was given as 0 0.045. And from this, we can calculate L. So L turns out to be 1.1 into 10 to the six. So since this is given in kilojoules per kg, right? So since L is 1.1 into 10 to the six. So since this is in kilojoules per kg. So if I uh, write this in kilo, so I would take a 10 to the three away. So this would just become 1.1 into 10 to the three, right?
suggest what can be deduced from the fact that section Q on the graph is less steep than section P. So section Q, if I think about it, what does section Q actually represent? So this was the boiling part, right? So the entire time in which uh, this uh, material, this uh, substance is boiling, so there is going to be a mixture of liquid and gas, right? Before this, as the temperature was riding, uh, rising, this must have been a liquid. And obviously after the state change, this is all just gas. So this part is steeper as compared to this part. So if I think about it, and if I go back up, so I was told that the heater is supplying energy at a constant rate to the substance, right? So the heater is supplying equal amounts of energy each second, right? So 150 watts simply means that each second the heater is giving uh, the substance 150 joules of energy. But what's happening is during this time, this 150 joules of energy, which was also supplied here as well as here. So here, when these 150 joules of energy are supplied, this temperature is not increasing as fast as was the case here, right? So if I think about this, so if I think about the energy and the energy here, so here and here, the same energies are being supplied, but here the uh, temperature is rising faster and here the temperature is also rising, but it's not as fast. So let's make a smaller arrow here, right? So if I think about which quantity links the energy supply to the rise in temperature, so you're absolutely correct. This is the specific heat capacity, right? Which is defined as the energy required, the thermal energy input to raise the temperature of a unit mass by a unit uh, change in temperature. So here and here E is the same. Obviously the mass of the substances is also the same in both these equations. Here delta T is smaller, right? So the specific heat capacity in section Q where the material is in a gaseous state. So here the specific heat capacity, since the uh, change in temperature is lower, the specific heat capacity is going to be higher as compared to P. So the reasoning, the conclusion I'm going to write is this. So specific heat capacity is higher is higher in the gaseous state. So that concludes this question. Let's go on to another one. So this is question number four. So this is related to simple harmonic motion. Four part A says the defining equation of simple harmonic motion is A equals negative omega square X, right? So A is uh, acceleration, omega is the angular frequency, X is the displacement. State the significance of the minus sign in the equation. So we know that this basically uh, tells us that the acceleration and the displacement are in opposite directions. So acceleration and displacement are in opposite directions. Right, and since omega square is a constant, A is proportional to X, but the negative sign shows that they are in opposite directions. A trolley rests, uh, a trolley rests on a bench two identical stretched uh, springs that are attached to the trolley as shown in figure 4.1. The other end of each spring is attached to a fixed support. The unstretched length of each spring is 12 centimeters. 
the spring constant of each spring is 8 newton meter when the trolley is in equilibrium the length of each spring is 18 centimeters so if i look at this diagram i can see that both the ends are attached uh, to a spring and the other ends of both these springs are attached to some sort of a wall or a support so if the unstressed uh, length is 12 so even at this position right when the trolley is not actually moving when the trolley is in equilibrium the length of each spring is 18 centimeters so even in the equilibrium positions both of these are stretched by 18 minus 6 by 6 centimeters right the trolley is displaced 4.8 centimeters to one side and then released assume that resistive forces on the trolley are negligible now what's going to happen is that these uh, this trolley is going to be displaced to either one of those sides and then it will be released right so assume that the resistive forces on the trolley are negligible show that the resultant force on the trolley at the moment of release is 0 0.77 newton so let's say uh, and this is totally up to you again the conclusion uh, based on whatever you do and this the conclusion is going to be the same so let's say this trolley is going to be displaced to the left what would happen so this trolley which is already extended right so this is going to be uh, displaced 4.8 centimeters so what's going to happen is that initially the extension of both of these are 6 and 6 but when this is going to be displaced 4.8 centimeters to the side the extension of this spring is going to reduce by 4.8 right so this extension would be 6 minus 4.8 on the other hand, if we talk about this spring, when this trolley is going to be stretched to the left, this is already extended by 6 and now it's going to extend by an additional 4.8. So this extension of uh, this spring would be 6 plus 4.8 centimeters, right? So you have both of these forces which are acting on uh, this block, right, on this trolley. And if I think about it, so both of these uh, forces are acting in opposite directions. So if this spring is displaced to the left, right? So what's going to happen is that this one is going to pull it to the left. And the way that this uh, spring is acting, this is going to pull it to the right, right? So this one is going to pull it to the right. And this one is going to pull it to the left. The reason I've made this arrow smaller is because I know that if this extension is smaller, so this force would also be smaller by Hooke's law. So if I now try to show that the resultant force is 0.77 newtons, so let me just first uh, calculate the force on the left spring, right? So that would be Kx. So K is 8 newton meter. So this is a newton, uh, sorry, newton per meter. So I would need to convert the extension to centimeters as well, right? So this would be 6 minus 4.8. So this is 1.2. So 1.2 into 10 to the negative 2. This would be the force exerted uh, by the left spring. And again, this force is also towards the left. So this turns out to be 0 0.096 newtons. If we talk about the force on the right spring, that would also be calculated using Kx. So the spring constant is the same, but its extension is different, right? This is 6 plus 4.8, so that would be 10.8 into 10 to the negative 2 this would give me the force exerted by the right hand spring and and again this force would be towards the right so this turns out to be 0 0.864 newtons so obviously this force is larger this force is smaller uh, so my assumption was that if the trolley is displaced to the left right so what I can see is that the force exerted by the right hand spring, which is towards the right, 
is going to be greater than the force exerted uh, by the spring on the left, which is also towards the left. So the resultant force would be the force by the right hand spring minus the force by the left hand spring, right? So this would be 0 0.864 minus 0 0.096. So this turns out to be So this is 0 0.768 Newtons. So to 2SF, this would become 0 0.77 Newtons, right? So this part is done. This was actually a bit tricky. The mass of the trolley is 250 grams. Calculate the maximum acceleration A of the trolley. So in the part above, we calculated the resultant force. So we can simply use F equals MA to find the acceleration. So that would be F upon M. So 0 0.77 divided by the mass. So if this is 250 grams, so that means this is 0 0.25 kilograms, right? So 77 upon 25. So this is 3.08 or just to 2SF, 3.1 meters per second square. Use your answer in A part two to determine the period of the, to determine the period T of the subsequent oscillation. So if we have to use, your, uh, if we have to use the answer in part two, which was actually the acceleration. So we know this is 3.1. And if I need to find the period, so this is obviously oscillation. So this is simple harmonic motion. So I would have to use this equation, right? So if I think about this, I already know A, which is 3.1, I found this. Omega square is what I don't know. And actually I know that omega is two pi upon T. So this is what's going to enable me to find T and X. So X is the displacement, right? X is the amplitude. So if I think about this, this entire system, was displaced 4.8 centimeters to one side. So this is basically the amplitude of oscillation, right? So 4.8 is the amplitude. So 4.8 centimeters, right? So what I've done is uh, since A equals minus omega square X, I calculated the maximum acceleration and the maximum displacement, which is also known as the amplitude. And I'm calculating omega square from here, right? So omega square is 3.1 upon 4.8 into 10 to the negative two. So this turns out to be 64.58, so simply 64.6 radians per second. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, why didn't I uh, include this negative sign? And the reason is this, uh, which is that if I talk about the maximum acceleration of the trolley in this position, right? So what I assumed was that the trolley is at a point like this. So its acceleration would be towards the right, while if I think about what its initial position was, the displacement was towards the left. And this actually proves, uh, this actually fulfills half the conditions that are required for this to be in circular motion. Sorry, not in circular motion, in simple harmonic motion. So the acceleration and the displacements are in opposite directions. So here, when I'm using this equation, so just to be very particular about this, I should have added a negative sign here, right? And then these negative signs would cancel out and omega square would turn out to be negative. But again, uh, this wasn't really uh, expected by the examiner. So omega turns out to be 8.04 radians per second, taking the square root. So two pi upon T is equal to omega. So if I just, uh, do 2 pi upon this thing for the time period. So this turns out to be 0 
or just to 2 SF 0 0.78 seconds. The last part of this question, this experiment is repeated with an initial displacement of the trolley of 2.4 centimeters. State and explain the effect, if any, this change has on the period of the oscillation of the trolley. So how would uh, this uh, experiment, so if the displacement is reduced, so previously this was 4.8, now this has become half of its value. How about if this has become 2.4, right? So again, if I think about how I actually came up with the time period, so first I calculated omega. And in this experiment, how I calculated uh, omega was first I calculated A and X was given to me. So I calculated the X according to that. And for A, I calculated F. And the way I calculated F was by considering the forces acting on this trolley uh, as per Hooke's law. So if I think about this, if the displacements are halved, right? So this extension would reduce. This extension would, uh, so this extension, so this was six minus 4.8, this would become six minus 2.4. This would become six plus 2.4, right? So the extension would change, right? So what is going to happen is that this force is going to become half. This net force, you would find that this is half of your original value. And if you don't believe me, you can just go ahead and try this for your own self, right? So since these extensions uh, change, right? So the resultant force becomes half corresponding to this. So instead of 1.2, if I'm talking about the left swing, this would become six minus 2.4. So let me just do this for you guys. So this is eight into 3.6, 10 to the negative two. So this value would actually become 0 0.288. This value right here. So this would be six plus 2.4. So let me just write this in purple, just for explanation, although this really isn't required. This would be 0 0.288. The force on the right uh, spring. So that would be six plus 2.4. Six plus 2.4 to eight into 10 to the negative two. This would be 0 0.672. Right, forces on both of these uh, would reduce. So if I calculate the net force here, so that would be 0 0.672 minus 0 0.288. So this turns out to be 0 0.384, which is actually exactly half of this, right? So if your displacement is reduced, these extensions would also change by such an amount that uh, the total force acting on this trolley is half. So if the trolley, if the force is half, so if I think about A, so if the force is half and the displacement, sorry, so since the uh, force was half, then the acceleration would also become half. And if I think about the displacement, so this is also half, right? So if this decreases by a factor of two, and if this also decreases by a factor of two, so then overall there is no change on omega, right? Omega square would still turn out to be this value. Omega would still turn out to be this value and the time period would still turn out to be this value, right? So if the initial displacement is reduced, the frictional, uh, sorry, not the frictional, uh, the resultant force halves, so resultant, force halves and displacement, I should rather say, and amplitude is also half. So no overall effect on time. Right, so this was question number four.
So question number five of this paper is actually uh, AMFM, which is not in the syllabus any longer. So let's go on to question six. Six part A says state a similarity between the gravitational field lines around a point mass and the electric field lines around a point charge, right? So we know uh, what the gravitational field lines are like, but uh, what we know about a point charge, so here the type of charge is not specified, right? So I know that the gravitational forces are always attractive, but the electric forces can be attractive or repulsive. Right, so I can't say anything about the direction of the field lines because I don't know what type of charge this is. So let's say if this was a positive charge, so I know any, uh, no, sorry. So since as if this would be a negative charge and since gravitational field lines are drawn from the perspective of a test positive charge, so that would be uh, attracted by a point charge at the center. So maybe then I could say, that both these field lines are pointing inwards, but this is not specified. So the other similarity has to do with the equations. So what happens if I just talk about the gravitational field strength or the electric field strength? So if I talk about G or E, both of these are inversely related to the square of the separation, right? So the way you draw these field lines is if you think about this R square, so your field lines are radial, right? So circles are basically represent equipotential lines is what we call. But if I talk about the gravitational field lines, then what's, uh, what happens is that the gravitational field lines are radial in both cases. So field lines are radial. Right, so by radial, I simply mean this, that these field lines are going to be initially closer together, but then these would be spacing out. The variation with R, or the variation with radius R of the electric field strength due to an Isolated charge sphere in a vacuum is shown in figure 6.1. So on this graph, we have on the y-axis, the electric field strength in 10, to the, uh, in 10 to the five volts per meter and the radius in centimeters. So we can see some sort of a trend that the electric field strength is first zero, and then it's following a, so it's falling off with distance, right? So this is actually related to a part in, uh, in the recent papers which we saw, and I talked about this there as well. So potential inside a sphere is constant, but the electric field strength is zero, right? Because the way we talk about such objects, we say that all the charge is just concentrated at the surface, right? So if you're inside the sphere in a region like this, so there is no charge enclosed inside the sphere. So it has no electric field strength. So use data from figure 6.1 to estimate the, to state the radius of the sphere. So till whatever point the electric field strength is zero, that is going to be the radius. So that is this mark right here. So this is simply going to be 2.1 centimeters. And now we have to calculate the charge on the sphere, right? So we have a graph of electric field strength versus uh, electric field strength versus the radius. So how about this point? So I know that at 2.1, this is the electric field strength. So I can simply use E equals KQ upon R square to find this charge. So if I say E equals KQ upon R square, if I just flesh it out and write it like this, q upon four pi epsilon naught r square, right? So that is the electric field strength of a sphere. 
So from this, if we want to calculate Q, so that would be four pi epsilon naught R square E. So four pi epsilon naught, this is what you have. Epsilon naught is 8.85 to 10 to the negative 12. The radius is given above 2.1 centimeters. And the electric field strength at this radius is this maximum value, which is 1.3 into 10 to the five. So 1.3 into 10 to the five. So if you just calculate this, this turns out to be 6.4 into 10 to the negative nine coulombs. Using the formula for the electric potential due to an isolated point charge, determine the capacitance of the sphere in V. So since we have the uh, electric field strength formula looking like this, so if I just talk about the fact that electric, no, rather we shouldn't talk about that. So the formula for the electric potential uh, of a sphere of a point charge is Q upon four pi epsilon naught R, right? So if I think about capacitance, capacitance is defined as the ratio of charge to voltage, right? So Q, I calculated as this, right? So if I think about C, which is equal to Q upon V, right? So Q, so C would be Q, upon V, which is Q upon four pi epsilon naught R. So Q is canceled. So this becomes one upon one upon four pi epsilon naught R, which is four pi epsilon naught R. So if I'm talking about the uh, capacitance of the sphere, so that would obviously be at the radius of the sphere. So four pi epsilon naught, so four pi, to 8.85 into 10 to the negative 12 into the radius, which is 2.1 centimeters. So 2.1 into 10 to the negative two. So this turns out to be 2.33 into 10 to the negative 12, or just to 2SF, 2.3 into 10 to the negative 12. Next question. So question seven also we can leave. This is op amps not in the syllabus anymore. Let's go on to question eight. So this is question eight. Two long straight wires P and Q are parallel to each other as shown in figure 8.1. There is a current in each wire in the direction shown, right? So both of these are carrying currents in the same directions. The pattern of the magnetic field lines in a plane normal to wire P due to the current in the wire is also shown, right? So these are the magnetic field lines which are forming due to this a current in the wire P. So draw arrows on the magnetic field lines in figure 8.1 around wire P to show the direction of the field. So again, you can just use your uh, right hand grip rule for this. So you should make your thumb point in the direction of wire P, right? And then the curling of your fingers should give you the direction of the magnetic field. So if you just do this, so what you'll see is the arrows pointing like this. And if I just continue this on the other side, this is what it would look like. So I have uh, the magnetic field strength, which is in an anti-clockwise direction. 
right? This is how the field lines point. Determine the direction of the force on wire Q due to the magnetic field from wire P, right? So from wire P, this is the magnetic field line which is uh, acting. So if I make a really long sort of a field line, right? So at this position, this is how the, uh, what do you call it? Not exactly like this, but let me draw it like this. So this is how the fields would be. So if I think about this, the field uh, at this point would actually be into the paper, right? So if I think about this, my second finger should uh, point in the direction of the current in the wire Q, right? So my second finger should point upwards. My first finger, which is the field, should point in the direction of the, what do you call it? So it should point, uh, it should point into the page, right? So my first finger is pointing into the page. My second finger is pointing upwards. So uh, by Fleming's left hand rule, the force exerted would be to the left, right? So determine the force. So this force is uh, to the left. The current in wire Q is less than the current in wire P. State and, state and explain whether the magnitude of the force on wire P is less than equal to or greater than the magnitude of the force on the wire in B. On the on the wire Q, right? So for this case, if I think about this, so what I'm told is that the current in wire Q is less, right? So if I think about uh, the magnetic force equation, so that is what your equation looks like: F he, F equals B I L sine theta. So if I talk about the force exerted by P on Q, so let's say through P, there is a greater current flowing, right? So since there's a greater current flowing, the magnetic uh, field strength, the magnetic flux density uh, from P that would be experienced at Q, this would be greater and the current in Q is smaller, right? So this force will have some value. Now, if I talk about the force at P due to Q, so through Q, the current flowing is less. So the magnetic field strength is going to be less as well. But through wire P, the current flowing is actually greater. So here, the same force would result, right? So this force, which is experienced on wire P and wire Q, actually would still be the same. And it doesn't depend on what the currents in each individual wires are. Right? It depends on the, so it depends on the product of the currents. Right? So this is what it depends on. Because what I could, I, so I, to show you guys something, I could just do this. So if I talk about the magnetic field strength at this point, this would just be F upon IL. Right? So this would be the magnetic uh, field strength at Q. So if I talk about the force exerted on this wire Q, that would be the product of the magnetic field strength uh, that P exerts on Q. So F upon I L Wait, I think I'm making a mistake here. So Sorry. So anyways, uh, so the current here is going to be something which is proportional to I. Right, so this current 
uh, this magnetic field at Q is going to be something proportional to I. So if I substitute this here, this would become K I square L sine theta, right? So L sine theta, this K, all of this is constant. So the force is actually not proportional to the current in either one of those wires. This is proportional to the product of these currents. So this current in P times the current in Q, right? So instead of I square, I should have actually written I P times I Q. So let me just correct this. This would be this would be K I Q. So this would become K I Q times I P. Right, and uh, you can also explain this using Newton's third law of motion. So, same force since it is proportional to product of currents. Let's go on to question number nine. So question number nine, define magnetic flux linkage. So magnetic flux linkage we know is, so phi is just BA, but magnetic flux linkage is also so it has the uh, another thing here. So N phi is what we call magnetic flux linkage. That is simply B A N. So I would say product of magnetic flux density, this is B. Number of turns, this is N. and the area perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. The next part, a solenoid of diameter is six centimeters and five forty turns is placed in a uniform magnetic field as shown in figure 9.1. So the solenoid is placed inside a magnetic field. So the solenoid has five forty turns and the diameter of this is six centimeters. The variation with time t of the magnetic flux density is shown in figure 9.2. So this is how the flux density is changing with time. This is not constant. Calculate the maximum magnitude of the induced EMF in the solenoid, right? So for the EMF, we know that the EMF is proportional to N delta phi upon delta T, right? This is Faraday's law. And if you just want to turn this into an equation, you would get rid of the proportionality sign, put an equals to here, and you would have a minus sign. So that will uh, that would then also incorporate uh, incorporate Lenz's law, right? So if I talk about n delta phi upon delta t, so this is simply the change in b a n with respect to the change in time. So b is uh, so b is actually not constant. This is the flux density. Area and N are constant. So if I'm talking about the maximum magnitude of the induced EMF, right? So EMF is basically proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage, right? So here, if I think A and N are uh, constant, so then the point at which the magnetic flux density is changing the fastest would be the point at which you would have the maximum EMF induced, right? 
So there are two portions where the EMF is changing. Uh, the magnetic flux density is changing. One portion is this. The other portion is this. So I can see that in, uh, that in one portion, the flux density is increasing. And then in another portion, this is decreasing to zero. But if I just ignore the increasing and decreasing part for now, and if I just talk about the rate of change, which one is going to be greater? So that obviously means the gradient. So in both of these, the magnitude of the change in the flux density is the same. From here to here, this is increasing from zero to 250. And in this portion, it is decreasing from 250 to zero. So then if the changes in the magnetic flux density are the same, so for a greater rate of change, the time taken should be smaller. And that means that I would have to talk about this for the maximum magnitude of the induced EMF, right? So I would need to select this part. So here the magnetic flux density is reducing from 250 to zero in a time of 1.2 seconds, right? So this delta B upon uh, delta T, this would be 250 millitesla upon 1.2. The area, so for this we were given the diameter, this was six centimeters. So the radius would be three. So pi r square, so pi into three into 10 to the negative two squared. And the number of turns, this was 540. So you multiply all these and the answer for the EMF you get correct to 2 SF. So this turns out to be 0 0.32 volts, right? So this would be the maximum EMF. And again, if you uh, didn't think about this, so even if you would find this answer, th that would definitely turn out to be less than 0 0.32. So again, you would have an EMF induced both in these and in these regions. But again, as with the graph questions that we have done recently regarding the uh, regarding the drawing of graphs, so I know that if the EMF is going to be a certain polarity, so let's say if the EMF is going to be positive in this region, so the EMF induced in this one should be negative or vice versa, right? So you just, uh, so whenever drawing the graph, you need to take care whether uh, this is an increase or a decrease because that is going to influence the uh, sign of the EMF. A thin copper sheet X is supported on a rigid rod so that it hangs between the poles, between the poles of a magnet as shown in figure 9.3. Sheet X is displaced to one side and then released so that it oscillates. A motion sensor is used to record the displacement of X. A second thin sheet copper Y replaces sheet X. Sheet Y has the same overall dimensions as X, but is cut into the shape shown, right? So it has some of these uh, slices missing. The motion sensor is again used to record the displacement. The graph in figure 9.5 shows the variation with time T of the displacement of each copper sheet. And here you don't know which copper sheet is which, right? But you can see that for the dotted one, this amplitude is reducing. State the name of the phenomenon illustrated by the gradual reduction in the amplitude of the dashed line, right? So here we know that the reduction in amplitude is called damping, but if you just wrote damping here, you would not get the mark. And the reason for this is the examiner has also told you that this is a gradual reduction. Right? Based on the types of damping we know, we know there is light uh, damping, there is heavy damping, and there is critical damping. So the only one which talks about a gradual reduction is light damping. Right? In critical damping, without even completing an oscillation, the system comes to rest. But in heavy damping, it takes a lot more time to come to rest. Right? 
the amplitude decreases by a lot, but it takes a lot of time for the system to actually come to rest. So this is light damping. Reduce which copper sheet is represented by the dashed line? Explain your answer using the principles of electromagnetic induction. So out of the two sheets, and this is a huge end for me that I have to use the principles of electromagnetic induction. So the equation that we just used above as well is that this is proportional to n delta phi upon delta t. So we know that this is simply uh, the change in Van upon the change in time. So for both of these, they're placed between the same magnets. So if I just write this equation, so B A N upon delta T. So for these, since these are placed between the same magnets, B is the same. And in this case, I don't have to worry about the number of turns, right? Because this is a simple solid sheet. So the difference then depends on the area, right? So the one which has more area would have a greater EMF induced, right? And here, basically the damping is caused by the flow of eddy current, right? So since there's going to be an EMF buildup on the body of the copper sheet, and this EMF buildup would be slightly different in these regions, there would be current flowing from higher to lower potential. Right? We know this from AS electricity, that this is how current flows. So the one in which you have a greater EMF induced, a greater eddy current would flow. And in that one, you would have a greater, so that one would slow down quicker. Right. So if I go back up here, this one has a smaller area. Right. So if I think about this, this area is smaller. So this induced EMF would be smaller. So the eddy currents would be smaller and this would actually take more time to come to rest. So then I deduce that the solid line must be Y and the dashed line must be the previous one, the solid copper sheet, which was X. So the answer I'm going to write is this. So, the induced EMF would be greater for the sheet with the larger area the eddy currents would also be larger there would be a greater or so there would be more damping Since Y has a smaller area, perpendicular to the magnetic field, The dashed line must be X. Question 10. The potential difference of an alternating power supply is given by this equation, 320 sine 100 pi t. You know, this is the amplitude of the 
this is the amplitude of the voltage, right? This is the peak voltage. And this is written in uh, the form omega t. So determine the RMS PD of the power supply. So RMS is the peak voltage divided by root 2. So 320 upon root 2. So correct to 2SF, this is 230 volts. Determine the period T of the output. So omega here is basically 100 pi. And we know omega can be written as 2 pi upon capital T. So pi is cancelled. So 2 upon 100 is 0 0.020, just to make this 2SF. So 0 0.02 seconds. The power supply is connected to a resistor R and a diode in the circuit shown in figure 10.1. State the name of this type of rectification produced by the diode. So we know this is half wave rectification. The uh, one which does not let the other half go to waste, which is the full wave rectification has a more complicated diagram. Right there you have uh, four diodes arranged in a bridge. On figure 10.2, sketch the variation with time t of the PDV uh, across r from time t equals uh, 0 to time t equals 40 milliseconds. So this basically means that since our time period was, uh, so our time period of the graph was 20 milliseconds, so there are going to be two half cycles here. Right. So the way half wave rectification works is, is, is that it keeps your positive half cycle, but the negative half cycle becomes zero. Right. And the reason for this is simply to, uh, due to the diode, which only applies, uh, which only allows current to flow in one direction. So if this end is positive and this end is negative in this uh, positive half cycle, so this diode will conduct. But when this uh, end becomes negative and this end becomes positive, so then the diode uh, the diode would not allow the current to flow. So then the voltage across the resistor simply becomes zero. Right. So if we go back to the graph above, uh, the equation above. So this is the peak voltage. This is the time period. So 0 0.02 seconds is your time period. So this is uh, one wave forming. So the first half cycle would be in this time and then this time, right? And the magnitude of these would be 320 volts. So those would be formed from here. So this is 320. And I only have to bother with the positive part in this case because in the negative part, I have no voltage. So this graph is going to look something like this. So from 0 to 10, I would have this sort of a wave. Again, no wave for the negative half cycle. Then another wave for another positive half cycle. Then again, no wave. Right? So this is how our graph is going to look. On figure 10.1, draw the symbol VR, draw the symbol for a component that may be connected to produce smoothing of VR. So for smoothing, we know that we use a capacitor and the capacitor is always connected in parallel for smoothing. Right, so this is how your capacitor is going to be connected. Question 11, electrons are accelerated through a potential difference of 15 kilovolts. The, uh, the electrons collide with a metal target and a spectrum of X-rays is produced. Explain why a continuous spectrum of uh, energies of X-ray photons is produced. So again, if you just know about how X-rays are produced, you can write the answer to this 
in a pretty straightforward manner. So when the electrons are first obviously accelerated through a very large potential difference, and then they collide with the metal target, right? So what happens is as they collide with the target, they decelerate, right? And this deceleration causes photons to be produced. So why is there a continuous spectrum? And the reason for these is simply that the electrons, all of these do not have the same de deceleration, right? So you have a total range of decelerations. So this is why there's also a range of uh, spectrum of energies produced, right? So these uh, photons which are released on deceleration, these are different energies. We know that photon energy is given by E equals HF. So since there's a range of frequencies, there is also a range of uh, energies. So this photon energy, which is released, depends on how much uh, the how much of the deceleration is produced. So electrons decelerate to produce X-ray photons. There is a range of decelerations. For these electrons. And since the deceleration determines the magnitude of the photon energy. A continuous spectrum produced. The next part, calculate the wavelength of the highest energy X-ray photon produced. Right, so again, the thing you need to remember is that the deceleration of the so the energy the electrical energy that the electrons have when they're accelerated through that potential difference is turned into the photon energy right so the energy of the electrons would simply be the accelerating potential difference multiplied by their charge right so this turns into the photon energy which is h f but if we write it in terms of the wavelength because that is what is asked this is going to be h c upon lambda so if i need to calculate lambda so this is simply going to be h c upon v q right this uh, wavelength of the highest energy this is actually called the cutoff wavelength and you might also recall this from this diagram that you might have seen in your book so the So this is how your graph for the energy, this is how the graph for the en energy and the wavelength V, right? I think maybe there's energy or intensity on this axis. So this uh, intercept is called lambda naught. This is also called the cutoff wavelength. So if we calculate this, so H is 6.63 into 10 to the negative 34. C is 3 into 10 to the 8. V, the accelerating potential difference, is 15 kilo. So 15 into 10 to the 3. And here, this Q is the charge of each particle, which is the charge of an electron. So 1.6 into 10 to the negative 19. So this cutoff wavelength turns out to be 8.3 into 10 to the negative. 11 meters.
A beam of X rays has an initial intensity I0. The beam is directed into some body tissue. After passing through a thickness X of tissue, the intensity is I. The graph in figure 11.1 1, shows the variation with X of ln I upon I0. So in one of the previous papers as well, we've looked at a graph which had a ln on the uh, Y axis and you have X in centimeters and the ratios here. Determine the linear uh, attenuation coefficient for this beam of X-rays in this tissue. So we know that the intensity at any point is given by this equation. So I know that there is some sort of an ln here. So if I just try to do the same thing, so here I have ln i upon i naught. So I can see from this equation that that is also relatively easy to get. If I simply divide by i naught here and take ln on both sides. So this would become ln i upon i naught equals ln e to the negative mu x, which is simply negative mu x. So if I now know this, so I just need to select a point on the line and work with that. So that point I can simply get as this, the extreme point. So on the y-axis, so this is a difference of 0 0.2 spread over five boxes. So each box is how much? So this is 2.2, this one, uh, this would be 2.24, so 2.28, right? And this is at a value of X as 11, right? So 11 and 2.28, Eleven centimeters and two point two eight. So eleven. So ln i upon i naught is minus two point two eight. This is minus mu, and x is eleven. So from here you can get mu. So two point two eight divided by eleven. This is zero point two zero seven. So just to two s of zero point two one per centimeter. Determine the thickness of tissue that the X-ray beam must pass through so that the intensity of the beam is reduced to 5% of its initial value. So using the equation above, what simply uh, this means is that the equation becomes 5% of the initial intensity. Right? So these cancel out. You have ln 0 0.05 equals minus mu x minus 0 0.21 times x. So from this, you can get your thickness. So this turns out to be 14 centimeters correct to 2SF. The last question. Radioactive decay is both sp uh, spontaneous and random. State what is meant by spontaneous decay? So we've also done this question quite a couple of times. So spontaneous simply means not affected by external or environmental factors. And what is meant by random decay? So random simply means that you cannot predict which nucleus will decay next. So cannot predict which nucleus will decay next. So strontium-90 is an unstable nuclide. The activity of a sample of 1 into 10 to the 9 kilograms of strontium is 5.2 uh, milli mega the mega 
yeah so this is mega so mega vector determine the decay constant lambda of uh, strontium 90 so for this you know that a equals lambda n is how the activity is linked to the total number of particles the total number of atoms in a certain uh, sample right so the activity corresponding to this mass in kilograms is this much. So first, we obviously need to calculate the number of atoms this is, right? So this is a, so this is a strontium 90, right? So one into 10 to the nine kilograms. So how many number of particles does uh, this become? So this mass is 90 U, right? So 90 U, right? This would be one mole. So actually, so if we use the concept of moles, right? And that uh, is how we can calculate the number of atoms. So if I talk about one mole of this, so moles, we know, is mass upon MR. But this mass must be in uh, grams as well. So 1 into 10 to the negative 9 plus 3, right? So if I just divide this by a negative 3 as well, to convert this into grams, and divide this by the molecular mass, which is 90. So from this, we can get the number of moles. And then I multiply that by 6.02 into 10 to the 23 to get the number of particles. So this turns out to be 1 into 10 to the negative 6 divided by 90 times 6.02 into 10 to the 23. So this turns out to be 6.02. 689 into 10 to the 15. So 6.689 to 10 to the 15. So I have also uh, multiplied by 6.02 into 10 to the 23 to get the number of particles. So then if we use A equals lambda n, so A is 5.2 mega. Lambda is what we need to find. So the number of nuclei, that is 6.689 to 10 to the 15. We just multiply these. If we just multiply these, so 5.2 10 to the 6 divided by this number. So this is 7.77 into 10 to the negative 10 or just to 2SF, this would be 7.8 into 10 to the negative 10 per second, right? The activity of the sample after a time of one half lives is found to be greater than the expected 2.6 megabacterial, megabacterial. So this is what was expected to be the half life, right? So this is the initial activity after one half life, the activity is supposed to be half of this, but this is found to be greater than this value. So just a possible reason for this. So a possible reason is that whatever it is uh, decaying into that is also radioactive. Right? So that is also decaying. So the daughter nucleus is also radioactive. Right? So if that is also decaying, so it would also have some activity which would, which would add on on top of this. So that concludes this live session, guys. Uh, in this one, we looked at March 21, paper 42. In the next one, we are going to be looking at 
so we are going to be looking at summer 21 papers. So thanks for your time, guys, and see you then. Bye-bye.